Good afternoon and welcome to today's Digital Dealer webinar sponsored by AdTaxi. Today's presentation is titled, Prove It, a show and tell guide for full funnel attribution. We're excited to introduce Brian Kroll, Vice President of Sales and Strategic Accounts at AdTaxi. This webinar should run approximately 45 minutes to an hour and in that time we'd love for you to answer, enter any questions you may have that will be answered by Brian at the end of this presentation. That being said, please welcome Brian. Thanks, Megan. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Megan. So, perfect. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for joining today and uh, spending some of your Thursday with us. Uh, here's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Basically, uh, how you want to set up for success uh, when talking about attribution. It's something that I'm, re I'm really passionate about. Um, how, how to best set up for success how to master the various attribution models that are out there and free and available to you to use for your business. Uh, we're gonna talk about offline attribution, uh, sort of the state of the union of what's happening with offline attribution and what's available to you to use right now. Uh, and then also we'll talk a little bit about tips for how to optimize your budgets based on the data that you uh, will learn about today. So without further ado, uh, my name is Brian Kroll. That's my, uh, my mug right there. Uh, Vice President of Strategic Accounts for Ad Taxi, and I've been with Ad Taxi pretty much since the beginning, back in 2011. Um, I reside in the SFA area with my wife and my uh, six-year-old son, and I'm trying to ho hopefully there's a chance that he uh, he won't try and barge into the door uh, into the office here while I'm on the webinar, but uh, he has a knack for trying to do that exactly at the wrong time. Uh, but we'll just roll with punches if that happens. And uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, Rock and Cool is the handle. Uh, anyway, so. Great quote here from John Wanamaker. Uh, the ultimate challenge and business opportunity here with attribution is, you know, half of the money that is spent on advertising is wasted. Trouble is, I don't know which half. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that quote. It's one of my favorites. And the reason I love attribution so much is it's really a, a tool for us to use to really drill down to know basically what's happening. And, you know, we called this prove it. Uh, one of the things that I, I like about attribution is, and sort of or my philosophy is to either prove it or move it, right? If you can't find that your advertising is working, uh, you should really move that budget into something that you can prove is working. So it's kind of the theme for today. We'll talk through a little bit about, uh, about this. But what is attribution? So attribution is really a process of identifying a set of actions uh, across multiple different touch points. And figuring out how those actions contribute in some manner to whatever it is you're trying to find, the desired outcome, right? So whether that's leads, form fills, et cetera, uh, and then assigning value to each of those events, kind of working backwards. And you may have a handful of small events, you may have tons of events. It really kind of depends on what it is we're trying to measure. But if we're talking about the consumer journey, when we're looking at people researching and buying a car, uh, the journey is definitely not linear, and you think about multiple different ways in which uh, there's people interact digitally with, uh, with, with information as they're thinking about buying a car. And if you look at the different sort of stages from engagement to nurturing to conversion, multiple different chances, right, for somebody to, to interact, whether there's multiple search touch points or exposure to paid media, organic videos, blogs, et cetera, uh, TV now, connected TV, all of these things are things that can be tracked and measured uh, in the journey in terms of how we find how somebody made it to your website, how somebody um, went back and forth from your website and looking at different, different actions after they left your website, eventually filling out forms. And when we talk about the offline piece of things showing up in your dealership or potentially actually buying a car and attributing all of those things back. So uh, pretty fun and exciting stuff. And the really the best way to sort of look at this is how do we set up for success? What's the best way that we can really build out a platform so we can measure everything and get really solid attribution? And really the, the, the starting place for that is pixels. And pixels are sort of the brains behind the scene here. Um, they're really gathering data. Uh, essentially what a pixel is, some people you may have heard of them as tracking tags. Um, but essentially they're snippets of code that you put on your website and they are, each platform has their own. So Facebook has their own pixel. Um, Google Analytics has, has its own tracking mechanism. Um, all the different ad platforms have their own pixel, Snapchat, um, Trade Desk, et cetera. All of those have their own pixels, but you, you place those at specific places on your website and they're able to track basically how users are either, you know, tracking through, through the website and landing on different pages or 
um, looking at, you know, what, what specifically somebody's done after being exposed to media. And you can use these for tracking. You can also use them for targeting. So if you're talking about like remarketing, et cetera, that's done through pixels. And as I mentioned, each platform has its own and they only talk to themselves. Um, and so that's it's a little tricky sometimes because you can get duplication if somebody's exposed to multiple different uh, touch points uh, from each platform and then they end up on a, on a, a form fill. Uh, you get three different conversions there, but it's only actually one. Um, so it's important, to, and when we're talking about attribution in terms of duplication, uh, when we get into that a little bit later. But, but essentially, um, what you really want to try and do is map the journey backwards with pixels, right? To try and find all of the important places on your website. If the end goal is a form fill or lead, price quote, et cetera, um, you really want to figure out what are the different steps that somebody might be taking on my website that I'd want to track that would lead them up to doing that. So maybe somebody is looking at the maps and directions page. Definitely probably looking at a vehicle description page, maybe looking at a search results page. If somebody searched for, I'm looking for this particular type of car, um, that, that landing on that page would be important, right? So maybe they're looking at your specials and then ultimately obviously tracking website visits. But you really wanna try and identify what are the specific touch points and make sure all of them are tracked across all of your advertising platforms. And if you're using Google Analytics, set up goals for each of those as well too, so you can see in uh, Google, Google Analytics from conversions, um, how those, how that click traffic is working for you in terms of attributing to success. So, so going, <clears throat> so attribution, you know, it's, it's, it can be very complex, but uh, we wanted to try and take a, a stab here at explaining this in uh, some relative terms that I think, you know, most of us potentially could, uh, could understand. And so we're going to look at how you attribute the effects of a great night out, right? So let's say that you know back in the back in the day when, when we were all allowed to actually go out to have happy hour, uh, you and your friends uh, had, had happy hour and you started your night out with uh, some fancy cocktails here, right? And then you ended up going to a pub and you had a had a round a round of beers, and you all sat down at dinner, had some wine with dinner, and uh, feeling good, I uh, decided to go out to a club. Next thing you know, you're closing down the club. You're the last one there. They're asking you to leave. Don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. So you end up at a cigar bar, uh, you know, smoking cigars and, and drinking scotch with this guy talking about cryptocurrency and conspiracy theories. And to top it all off, uh, throw down a little fast food at the drive-thru. Uh, it's just to try and, you know, get, get the case of the munchies here, right? So all of these things, I have to a great night out. Next morning, wake up, feel terrible. There's chicken in your room, might be a tiger in the bathroom, missing a tooth, et cetera, trying to figure out what happened the night before, right? So... Uh, this is really how we're going to try and look at the attribution of a hangover uh, to really sort of look at like assessing the influence of multiple different channels here uh, to determine what should we give credit to for the hangover, right? So stole this uh, to a degree from, from our friends at Google, but uh, love this example. And essentially, you're thinking about the attribution of a hangover, waking up the next morning feeling terrible. If you're looking at a last interaction, you're basically saying, hey, last interaction, Taco Bell should get 100% of the credit for why I feel so terrible, right? Nothing to do with the four gallons of booze that you drink. So may not be the best model for how we attribute success from when we're looking at uh, you know, different ad platforms, right? And Google Analytics is inherently last click. So sometimes if you're not looking at how everything else works in the model, you're potentially missing out on how you really got to the state that you want to get to. So if you're looking at first interaction, you know, is it fair to blame your hangover on the first drink that you had? Probably not, right? Probably not as fair as you would, same thing, blaming it on Taco Bell. If you're looking at a linear attribution model, what a linear attribution does is it assigns even credit through each of the touch points, right? So every single touch point here gets at least some credit and an even amount. Uh, you divide the total by six and each of those gets, the, gets their own credit for, for how you feel the next morning, right? Uh, then there's position-based models. And what position-based models do is they'll assign a percentage of the credit to the first touch point and to the last touch point. So, uh, typically, it'll be like either 30 or 40% to each. And then they'll distribute the remaining touch points evenly um, in, in the middle. So in this case, if it was 30% to the first drinks, 30% to Taco Bell, and then each of the remaining 40% was divided into, into these, each would get 10%. May or may not be the right way, but it's a it's an interesting way to kind of look at things as well because you definitely want to value everything throughout the path. Then you have time decay models. 
And time decay models are essentially re rewarding more and more credit or signing more and more credit as you get towards the, the closer to the time of conversion. So in this case, the, the early on drinks get a small percentage of the credit, then the beers get a little bit more credit, then the wine gets you know, even more credit and so on and so forth until you get to the end. And you can look at time decay models over typically like a seven day period or one day period a um, couple of different ways to look at it, but essentially this is another way that you can assess the, the influence here. So of all of these models, you know, one of the ones that's actually missing from here is a data-driven model. And what a data-driven model talks about is really, if I remove one of these pieces, how much does the end change? And let's say, you know, if you were to remove the, the scotch, do you feel any different? If you remove the Taco Bell, do you remove, feel any different? Um, Data-driven models are complex and uh, typically pretty hard to do outside of multiple different platforms, but they work pretty well within an individual platform. So within Google Ads, within Facebook, um, those are some pretty interesting models to look at. Um, but as far as comparing everything across the board, uh, typically you're gonna wanna look at multiple different models, the, the sort of five that I've shown here. So how do you know what's the right one for your business? So some questions that we typically like to ask for any business, right? What's the time lag or what's the length of the consumer journey? Somebody Is somebody deciding something relatively quickly and are there very few touch points or is it potentially a really long journey and you have multiple different touch points? You know, with, with buying a car, uh, I've heard anywhere from six weeks to three weeks to two weeks, kind of depends on each individual user's uh, touch points, but basically that's kind of what we're, um, what we're, what we're looking at here is, you know, what's the total length of the journey? And then how many of these touch points do they have? How do you look at the lifetime value, right? Is somebody going to be buying just one thing from you from time to time or multiple different things? Uh, once you get somebody from a car, are we going to look, you know, factoring in their service business into the lifetime value? Uh, you want to look at how competitive is the industry? Um, in general and also in your immediate marketplace and then how unique is your individual value proposition? Those are all questions that you want to sort of think about in terms of how you factor uh, which attribution model to to look at and You know typically what we have found at ad taxi is longer cycle and higher price point purchases um, that have a lot of different touch points, such as buying a car, uh, you want to probably look at either even credit or position-based models um, because you want to try and see across the board what's working, what's contributing. Um, in this case, this is where that, that first touch, like the awareness, how did somebody first find out about me? That's typically pretty valuable. And we see oftentimes search being um, a, a really solid first and last touch point. Um, across the middle, you want to, you'll see definitely like more social display type things oriented also in the, on the first touch side of things. Um, but this is how you would, you would sort of look at it. If you were looking at a position based model, it'd be 30% to the first touch, 40% goes spread out across all of the middle. It's the influence. And then that last conversion event, what got somebody to actually, um, convert and sub submit that, that price quote, et cetera. Uh, maybe that gets 30% of the credit, but lots of different ways to kind of look at it here. And essentially, um, what we try and try and see when Google Analytics and, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's focused on the last click. There's tremendous amount of value in top of funnel campaigns, trying to figure out how somebody first heard about you, how you're nurturing and influencing somebody, engaging them throughout the process. And the way to really look at how to prove that top of funnel is first we have to understand sort of the, the nuances within each platform and how far back can you look? Um, and so in Facebook itself, uh, the platform in the UI has the maximum length that you can look back for any conversion window is 28 days. And that's for both post click or post view. And kind of the standard you set up for your account, I think most people go with like 28 day click, one day view. Uh, we like to look at 28, 28, both 28 day click and 28 day view to get the best possible um, look at how the platform, uh, how, the, how what's happening in the platform. Um, Google Ads has a 90 day maximum post click or post view attribution available. Uh, oh, and I mentioned, perhaps I mentioned on Facebook, last touch gets credit in the user interface. So if your remarketing campaign is the last touch that happened for that user before they filled out a form fill, that's what's going to get the, the credit. But Facebook attributes things a little funky. They actually give that credit to the day that the last touch happened, not the day of the conversion. Um, Google Ads, however, if you're looking at uh, that, that window, it goes out a maximum of 90 days for post-click and post-view. 
Um, typically, you can set, most people will set it around 30 days. I think that makes generally a lot of sense for, for how you're going to be optimizing. Uh, and last touch gets the credit as well. And it depends on how you're pulling in the conversions there. If you're looking at the, if you're using a Google um, a tracking tag and you're counting conversions that way, um, that will happen based on when uh, uh, the, the actual conversion happened. But if you're pulling it through Google Analytics, uh, it might be a little bit different. So if you're looking at real-time bidding platform, the platform that we use at AdTaxi, that has a 90-day maximum as well for post-click and post-view. And again, last touch gets credit in the UI. Um, but there are ways in, in our platform where we can see first touch influence and other things as well through special reports that we can run. Um, so while the UI shows last touch credit, um, we really want to look at the full value of what's also influencing throughout the, throughout the journey. I should also mention that in the default for Google Ads is last touch, but you can also set up multiple different attribution models in Google Ads as well too. So you can set up data-driven models in Google Ads uh, and let Google truly try and find the the best possible way um, to, to optimize your campaign based on what it can see from a data-driven model inside Google Ads. It's only looking at just Google Ads, but it's a, it's a great way to, to, to set up um, your campaigns. And the numbers will look a little bit different, but uh, we find that it can be a, a pretty effective tool. So speaking of Google Analytics, um, if you want to try and determine what is my path length, right? How, how long does it take typically for somebody to, to interact with me? Um, the way to find that is I kind of did a little uh, screen grabs here, but uh, on the left-hand side, when you first load up your Google Analytics, if you see on the left-hand side here where uh, it's all condensed under conversions, you want to click on conversions, and then that expands out. And from there, you want to click on multi-channel funnels. And then from there, underneath multi-channel funnels, you want to click on path length. And when you click on path length, what you'll see is uh, something that kind of looks like this, right? So um, from, a, from a time, time lag perspective, um, you can see in how many days, uh, how many conversions are happening within a certain amount of time and how far out does that go? And it's, it's tricky because you want to make sure, you know, it, it inherently will group all of the conversions together at once. So if you're tracking conversions as VDP pages and uh, search results pages, et cetera, uh, if that's what you, if that's what you're looking at, it will pull everything in. So you may have a ton of that happening in a short amount of time. In this case, about 73% of the conversions are happening with two day, within two days of the first visit, but 15% are happening after 12 or more. And so you want to select and filter, uh, and that's something you can do at the top. I didn't share it in this screen grab here to protect this, uh, this account. Um, but you can select that to say, I just want to look at maybe just form fields or price quotes, and then you'll be able to see that, that time lag in days there. And sort of our best practice tip here is you want to give yourself enough time to capture as many conversions as possible all of these platforms are utilizing machine learning. And so if you were to say, all right, Facebook is only going to be, I only want to look at one days or seven days uh, or something along those lines and set that up as default, um, you're not going to really, you're potentially selling yourself short or shooting yourself in the foot by not giving the platform enough data. The more data that you have to utilize all the machine learning platforms um, like, you know, Facebook and Google ads and uh, trading desk, et cetera, uh, they'll do better with their own internal optimizations and help you out in the long run. There's also a way here under, uh, under path length where you can see sort of on the right, the overlap of the various, various different parts of the path because it might not be just one interaction. In this case, you can see that um, users, there were three different interactions where people interacted with direct organic search and paid search um, multiple different times. So about 5% of, of all conversions happened where there were three different touch points um, where, the, where the user came into the platform. So a great little tool that you can look at in Google Analytics where you can kind of see where the overlap is um, from your different platforms. Google Analytics also improving the value of top of funnel campaigns. Assisted conversions versus first or last click um, are, are definitely key. And as defined by Google, assisted conversions, the higher those numbers, the more important the assist role of that particular channel. Whereas with last click or direct conversions, the higher those numbers, Generally, the more important that channel's role is in either driving, you know, completion of sales and, and conversions, whereas first click, the higher those numbers, that's really more of initiating new sales and conversions. And, you know, their assisted conversions are not mutually exclusive across channels. Two channels that assist in a, a single conversion path are basically each credited with the assisted conversion, right? So the total number of assisted conversions to each channel may be larger than the total number across all channels. 
but it's a great way to sort of look at, uh, at your campaigns. If Google Analytics isn't giving it the last touch credit, is it providing influence as a first touch or an assist? And the way you see that here, right? So Google Analytics inherently is giving all of the credit to the last touch. You really want to look beyond Taco Bell to find out what really got you that, that vicious hangover. So the way to see that is in your Google Analytics, you click on the assisted conversions here underneath multi-channel funnels. And then you'll see something that looks like this, where essentially it starts out at sort of the default is the multi-channel funnel grouping but you can go out and choose whatever you want. So if you wanna see by source and medium, you just click here where I have kind of highlighted, and then you'll see in, for each different channel, uh, in this case, paid search has you know, 8,400 last click or direct conversions, but it has 5,900 assists, um, and then direct organic search, et cetera. So you can kind of see like, you know, how each of the different channels work and play around and look at it by source and medium if you wanna get better clarity into what's happening <clears throat> for, your, for your, your paid media spend. Under top conversion pass, this is another great report in Google Analytics. Um, you know, how are people interacting? Where are my conversions coming from? Uh, in this case, by clicking on top conversions path over here and then clicking over on source medium path, you can see how did people interact. So in this case here, you had um, the second, second path here would be uh, 1,000 conversions happened where somebody came in originally from Google Organic and then they came back to direct. So direct means that when, if you're, if you just type in the, the browser and you don't use the search engine. So I didn't go into Google and, and dealer, you know, Joe's car dealership and end up uh, clicking on an organic link. That would be organic. Otherwise I just went straight into my browser and went to www.joesauto.com, et cetera. Uh, and that would be, that would be contributed as a, as a direct conversion. So the way to look at model comparisons in Google Analytics in terms of saying, okay, what, what, how should I value conversions based on uh, all, of, all of the different um, attribution models? You can actually build multiple different models and then start to see the comparisons across either all of your default channel groupings or potentially at the source and medium level. So the way to do that is click under model comparison tool on the left-hand side and then it'll start up with last interaction. And then over here, you'll still basically have a way to compare up to three different models. And then um, position-based is a model you can use. You can look at time decay. And then as you plop all of these in, you'll see over here on the right, you can kind of compare the percentage of change in conversions. And so uh, in this instance, direct is at, the, is at the front here. When you're comparing last click, last interaction to, to position-based, direct actually loses 13% and also loses 8% versus a time decay. But organic search gains 15% in conversions, changing conversions, when you're looking at um, position-based versus direct, uh, sorry, last click, and it gains 9% here. Um, referral traffic gains 14% when you're looking at the change from last interaction. Uh, and social gains 20% when you're looking at it. So, really looking at each channel and specifically source medium, you can kind of see where the strengths are of each individual channel and start to understand, you know, maybe you want to look at first interaction and see how that plays out and how that plays out from a, from a last interaction. These are all tools that you can use that are free and available uh, basically to, to see what's actually working. And if you kind of look up here in the, in the top left, you can choose all conversions or you could just select a few conversions and you could also look at all of your traffic coming in or if you have Google ads hooked up, uh, integrated with your Google Analytics, you can look at just what's happening in your Google campaigns and you can also toggle the look back window here to see how far back you wanna go. So some great tools here uh, that you can use that are free from Google Analytics uh, to get better clarity in terms of what's happening from, from your paid media. Second here. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, one thing um, that I want to point out to before I jump off to online attribution, uh, Google Analytics is inherently looking at just click traffic. So uh, while it's a great tool for what's coming in on the click side of things, it's not complete because it's not really looking at um, impressions. And uh, it's a little bit of a hole. One thing that we have found uh, in particular, like YouTube campaigns, convert incredibly well, but you have to measure them by looking at impression activity as well. The click activity from YouTube campaigns is not representative of what you're going to see. So um, one of the little holes and just sort of a caveat of what to look for 
uh, when you're measuring everything through is that Google Analytics is 100% click-based and does not value impressions in the model. So let's talk about offline attribution. This is one of my favorite things. And um, what you're seeing here is uh, an example of I actually helped a client build a first party identity graph to, to track offline attribution from their CRM. Uh, a lot of work went into it, pretty complicated stuff. You don't have to worry about doing all of this stuff because there's great tools that are available for free right now uh, that can be done. And I want to kind of show you, walk you through sort of like what's available now for like the state of the union. And um, Google Store Visits is one of my favorites. Um, basically how it works is it's aggregated it was statistics. It's all anonymous. Um, Google creates model numbers by looking at sort of the data that you have uh, from your phone. And basically what happens is if you have a, uh, if you're signed in on a device uh, on, a, on, a, on a, in any Google platform and it's, it's able to basically like look at your GPS and where your phone's kind of popping up. Um, but essentially, um, you can look at model numbers based on uh, people who have clicked or viewed on Google search, display, or YouTube ads, and then later visit your store. Um, and you can't see like an actual individual. You, so you can't say like, hey, Brian was you know, looking at my ad and all of a sudden his GPS pinged in, pinged in my store. Um, but it looks at it from a model perspective. And um, you can report that in, uh, your, in your Google Ads account and assign value there. So um, there's some steps to qualify. Uh, you know, not everybody can unfortunately do it, but um, you essentially have to go in and create all your store locations uh, in your Google My Business account. Uh, you have to link that account to your Google Ads account, and then you have to have at least 90% of your linked locations verified in Google My Business. Uh, you have to have location extensions active in your ads account. And um, the kicker is you really have to get a lot of ad clicks and viewable impressions for it to work. Um, and you have to have a sufficient store visit data on the back end to attribute ad clicks uh, and that impression to pass in, you know, pass Google's privacy thresholds. Um, but this is something that works. It works really well. Um, you can actually use automated bid models um, from these reports in Google Ads, which is pretty cool. But um, what can you see from a reporting standpoint is, uh, you know, you can down to the, the campaign and ad group level in Google Ads UI um, or in Google Ads reporting, you can see um, which campaigns are actually driving store visits. So you want to click on the segment button in Google Ads. Uh, and then you'll be able to look at the conversions or conversion actions to see a specific breakouts of those conversions based on the conversion action name and see store visits there. Um, you can also set a value if you want to for store visits when you set it up. So if you know that, you know, for every, let's say your conversion rate is, you know, 10%, right? And you say that, hey, this is a store visit value is, uh, and you say, look, my average sale is $20,000 or something along those lines, you know, 10% of that, you'd say, all right, well, I'm going to assign a, uh, a $2,000, uh, you know, cost per store visit or something like that. You can build that out if you want or however you want to factor that in. And then um, for your campaigns, um, you can, you can essentially build that out. So you can have Google use a bidding model to bid for uh, maximum return on ad spend or maximum value or maximize store visits. Um, <clears throat> one of the, one of the, uh, the tricks here, there are also some, some predefined reports you can look at. So you can see in the, the top right hand corner of your Google Ads account, you click on predefined reports and then conversions and store visits, and that'll <clears throat> show you some data there as well. As I mentioned, you can use this data for optimizations or smart bidding, smart bidding, excuse me. So whether that's maximized conversions or target ROAS or target CPA. Um, one thing to note is that store visits really need a 30 day window for sort of optimum conversion data aggregation. We typically see it come in pretty close, but uh, we really want to give it a full 30 days so Google can model that out. Um, and, you know, our best tip on this is it, oh, by the way, so you also have to have last click attribution model only. It's the only thing that's currently available within Google Ads, um, but that's, a, that's not a bad thing. Um, we found this to be pretty accurate. Uh, you know, we compared this with, with other data and it seems to be pretty solid across the board. And you know, our tip here though is to, you know, while it is pretty accurate, use the data directionally. Don't take it as an absolute. Um, but in general, you know, if you have campaigns or ad groups that are running and they're not generating store visits, probably want to start reallocating that budget um, to, to something that is. And this is a great example of we've seen YouTube do really, really well in driving store visits, um, but it doesn't really show up in Google Analytics for um, you know, conversion events. So you might typically look at optimizing away from that but if you're looking at this from sort of a holistic perspective, um, it actually is working and it's driving folks to the dealership. 
So similar to store visits, uh, another tool for offline attribution is called geofenced attribution for uh, real-time bidding. And so the way that this works, you know, we partner with third-party geolocation providers uh, and using that data, um, you know, they're, they're basically like, you know, you have to be signed into apps that are using the location, but these partners are in, uh, you know, apps like Uber and Apple Maps, Facebook, et cetera. So they pretty much have a pretty good idea of, you know, where folks are, but, um, Basically, anybody who's been exposed to real-time bidding ads, whether that's display or native or audio or video or connected TV, uh, and then those folks, um, their devices or connected device actually goes inside the geofence that you set, and it's accurate down to uh, like three meters. Um, you can you can say these folks came into the they ended up on the lot, um, and again, you can't really tie it to individuals due to privacy restrictions, but this is also something that works pretty well. Um, the pros of this type of attribution is, you know, it's really a good directional, uh, you know, data. As I mentioned, it's a it's the impact of sort of foot traffic in each store location. Um, it's it's they're pretty good at uh, tracking, you know, the filtering out um, anomalies. So, uh, you know, you want to get people who are just driving by or walking by. They're looking at sort of like the speed, timing, history, and frequency. Um, they typically filter out like employees. So devices that are showing up all the time within a location don't get counted if somebody's exposed to ads. Uh, and what this allows you to do is make some pretty detailed in-flight optimizations to campaigns to know like what's actually working to drive store visits. Um, some of the cons to this though, and just being transparent, uh, you can't determine if somebody made a purchase or not, right? So there's also potential for misattribution it doesn't do well for uh, really densely populated areas or multi-level shopping locations. Um, if you have, let's say, uh, your, your dealership that's in a in a in a you know a very urban environment and there's like a, a subway or something subway station below you, that may may cause a problem. Um, but uh, you know it's, it's dependent on that mobile GPS data. Um, sometimes you get limited trackability in rural areas, and sometimes the measurement costs can you know really chip into media spend, but it's a great way to, to look at it overall to see, you know, are we driving folks to the dealership, which is, which is ultimately the key. Now, one of my favorites is Facebook and Facebook offline events. <clears throat> so Facebook uh, has absolutely massive amounts of data. They have probably like the best, uh, you know, user ID graph, um, device graph on the planet. And the reason they have that is because they have all this data and users self-declare their first and last names, their email address, their phone, the city. Uh, most of the time it's pretty accurate, um, but you also have to be logged in, right? So you're logged in, you can't access Facebook uh, either online or through the apps without logging in. <clears throat> and what Facebook hit, does is essentially they're able to track any and all ad interactions um, on Facebook or Instagram or Marketplace or Messenger, et cetera. All the clicks, all the impressions, and what you can do as a business is you can upload your offline event data and then Facebook will take that data and match it up against their graph and say, were any of these people exposed to any ads uh, or to click on any ads um, during whatever time frame you're looking at? And if so, um, they contribute that as an offline event. And so you can take your actual uh, CRM, uh, DMS data from your dealership, upload that into Facebook, and then know um, how much Facebook was uh, responsible for uh, at least having one touch point for multiple different ads for actual cars sold or for service business, et cetera. So really amazing tool. Um, the pros here that you can actually prove sales related to Facebook or Instagram media exposure. It's free. It's pretty easy to set up. Um, and, you know, there's some pretty good cost benefit that we've seen when you choose to optimize to offline events uh, in Facebook and it shows up as offline purchases. You can set it up as like offline um, anything really, but it's a uh, pretty easy setup. The cons of this is it requires pretty frequent uploading of your CRM or DMS data. Uh, and that, that data has to be pretty accurate, right? So if, uh, if, if names are transposed for some reason, or if email addresses or phone numbers, um, generally dealerships do a, a better job at this than most businesses. Um, but it's uh, accuracy is, is key. Um, and then also, uh, you know, you probably want to have two to 300 conversion events monthly for this to really work well, but we've seen it work with as few as a hundred. Um, but definitely something that's a free tool where you contribute, you know, within Facebook, uh, your, your offline conversions based on hard data. <clears throat> so 
this sort of brings us to uh, the next step, and that is um, about a year and a half ago or so, um, this was November, uh, November 2018, Facebook released the attribution tool or their advanced measurement solution. And it's very similar to what you would get with, um, you know, sort of a Google Analytics or Google's attribution. But uh, the nice thing about Facebook's tool is you can actually pull in um, other platforms. And, you know, one, one of the big holes uh, you know, you have a lot of different walled gardens here, right? So Facebook doesn't want to have anybody putting, you can't put any tracking tags inside Facebook. You can't have anybody, um, you know, drop any sort of a compression tracking tag. So you lose out um, from impression related activity if you're looking at Google Analytics or trying to do any attribution modeling there. You don't do that in Facebook, right? So um, with Facebook attribution, you can upload all of that data. You can look at the offline purchases and then you can look at not only what's happening with Facebook from your impression data there and look at multiple different models, but you can also pull in different media sources. So it's looking at the pixel that's on your website and if you're able to look at organic, uh, paid search, et cetera, you can set up and configure different, um, different campaigns uh, on your display side of things. So you can look at impression data there uh, and that allows you to compare multiple different windows and models and go back beyond uh, just the 28 days in the UI, you can go back actually 90 days and compare different models and see what's actually happening. And uh, if you import the cost mapping from all of this, you can get a, a really good return on investment picture for all the integrated platforms that you have. Um, not every platform is integrated. Some of the cons there that uh, Snapchat won't allow this. Um, you can't put any tracking tags on Snapchat or on LinkedIn or on Twitter, um, but you can do it for Google and Bing and trading desks. Um, and, and it's, it's really great. And again, you know, you have to upload that data frequently to see the, see the results. Um, typically weekly, at least monthly would be, would be great if possible. Uh, and that data is accurate, but it's a really great tool that we like, um, to, to look at sort of across all of the different, uh, interactions to see you know, what's actually working and what's actually generating offline purchases. So now to the, the really fun part is how do we take all of this data and how do we look at, you know, optimizing budget based on everything um, that we've just kind of talked through. So the key thing I think is really looking at a healthy funnel. Um, you want to look at, as we mentioned earlier, you know, multiple different steps. What are people doing on your website? What are people doing offline activity? Combining all of this data through micro conversions is key and also looking at multiple different um, multiple different windows, right? So get all of the all of the of the conversions set up along the way and figure out what's working there. But then you also want to see, okay, great, I drove a lot of people to a VDP page or maps and directions page, but you want to have a mechanism through the offline tracking. Are these people actually still going into the store? So through a store visit tracking or whatever. Um, but really trying to assess the, the influence of these campaigns across the entire spectrum, right? Um, really want to value the assist to get you to the top here. And um, when I say value the assist, you know, when I talk about prove it or move it, um, essentially the best advice I can give for optimizing budgets is get all of your different, don't just rely on one attribution model, but run multiple different models and look at all of your media through that lens of multiple different models. And if you see that there's something that you're doing that is not generating uh, an offline conversion, a store visit, anything that's sort of like, you know, after, after 90 days or whatever it is, if it's not doing anything good for you, uh, you should move it and reallocate that budget to what is. And um, while you, you know, you may see some, some channels have uh, disproportionately higher amount of conversions than, than others, um, that's great, but you can you look at that data and figure out, okay, well, where should I be moving my budget? Um, you really want to also look at, you know, the timing here too. And, and you know, I kind of have this moonshot in here because, uh, you know, looking at what happens if you, if, in, if you, if you make adjustments um, too soon or too early, and if you know it's a really long journey, you aren't really going to really know until you're, you're too late, right? I was watching some, something on the, uh, the Apollo missions the other night. And uh, it's really interesting where they have to, you know, they have a precise window of when they have to fire the, the burners as they're leaving Earth. Otherwise, they're going to essentially miss the moon's gravitational pull completely, right? So uh, you're not going to know that until you get there. But obviously, you can kind of track things. But you really want to try and make small incremental changes, sort of steering as opposed to saying, like, wow, this is really driving a ton of, uh, you know, last-click interactions, form fills, and putting all my eggs in this basket. 
you won't know until you're too late that maybe there were channels that you were working on that were driving a lot of uh, uh, a lot of conversion events um, earlier, more upper upper funnel channels, and you moved everything to the lower funnel, and then you lost out on your funnel. So basically, you know, when you're looking at optimizing budgets, we found that if you look at multiple different models, um, position-based models um, tend to display and social do do better in those because those channels typically are sort of more in the engagement stage um, and they kind of undervalue search uh, search ironically you know most people think of search as more of a last click channel or a last touch conversion uh, we found actually that search is as much first touch as it is last touch um, and sometimes it's both so we want to try and look at multiple different models and and understand sort of you know with each platform what's happening right and definitely try and make sure that you're looking uh, far enough out in your attribution window um, based on your objective. Prospecting might be something that you want to look at a much larger window and say, okay, from anything of my dedicated efforts where I know this is like a pure prospecting play, maybe I want to look at first touch and maybe I want to look at 28 days. And maybe from like a remarketing standpoint, I want to say, all right, well, what's really working within seven days and driving the best activity for my, all of my remarketing campaigns? Um, single most important advice I can give is make sure that you're valuing impressions as much as you are clicks. If you know, it, you have to compare the individual platform metrics as well as part of your decision making process. As I mentioned, if you were just looking at clicks in Google Analytics, YouTube may not work out all that well, but YouTube may be driving a massive amount of store visits if you're looking at that in the Google Ads UI. So, you know, that impression data is is huge and key. We see the same thing from Snapchat, Facebook, Display, all of these different platforms, if you're not valuing the impressions and if you're not looking at a long enough window, um, you could be optimizing away from something that's really working well. You just haven't really given it the time to, to really prove out that it's, that it's doing what it should be doing. So uh, key takeaways here, you know, ultimately, best thing you can do, set up for success, make sure you've got a solid architecture and foundation really try and understand the influence of all the different channels, play around with multiple different attribution models, uh, look and see how, how your media is, is impacting everything, and then look for the assist, right? Make sure you're valuing all of the interactions and it's not just looking at last click. And then when you do make budget moves, make, make small budget moves, make budget moves that are gonna be something that, um, you know, you're not gonna just throw all your eggs in, in one basket and then all of a sudden be a, uh, way off track and it's too late. So um, that's kind of, I think, it in summary here. So uh, ultimately, you know, want to try and solve this question, hopefully with the information that uh, we've talked through today. Uh, you guys can have a, a, a much better time at figuring out what money is uh, wasted and which half. So thank you guys all so much for joining us today. Um, if you want to learn more about AdTaxi, you can check us out at adtaxi.com. Uh, find out events on AdTaxi events or look at our resources on adtaxi.com slash resources or contact us at info at adtaxi.com. And with that, I will turn it back over to Megan. Thank you so much, Brian. Everyone, we're now in the Q&A portion of our webinar. So if you haven't already, please submit any questions you have for Brian by using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. I have a few questions here for you, Brian. Is it possible to okay. use different attribution models for different media or is that not a good idea? It, it is possible. Um, I think that, you know, looking at, uh, if, you're, if you're looking at, you know, moving budget around, I would say try and find a, a one model that works best and is probably like, you know, the stick with one model for budget moves. Um, but I definitely like looking at different models to see, you know, is there any influence here? And, you know, from the instance of looking at paid search versus, uh, you know, display or something like that, maybe look at, maybe it's better from like a, a first click or a first touch model as opposed to a last touch model or, uh, you know, position based. But um, yeah, I think it's, it is possible, but if you're going to be looking at making budget decisions based on that, um, I would use one model so that it's consistent. How can I tell if connected TV is actually working and selling cards? Connected TV. So uh, that's a great question. Um, connected TV is tricky in the sense that, you know, you can't actually click on a TV ad, right? So you have to have a mechanism um, that allows you to either track, uh, you know, either store visits through connected TV or offline events. Um, Facebook attribution does work. We can track, we can track that on our side. 
um, by mapping uh, impression tracking tags. It's kind of a tricky way to do it, but you can actually do that. So you can say, hey, these people were exposed to connected TV ads, and then they actually bought a car. Not these people, but you know, this. Um, you can track the, the effects of the ad group, et cetera, aggregated. Um, and then you can also do it from like a store visit perspective uh, too, if you're looking at sort of like offline, uh, like geofence conversions. Thanks, Brian. I have another question here. If you were working with a limited digital media budget for a retail brick and mortar store, where do you recommend getting started? Uh, wow. Um, I, I guess it depends on how limited the budget is. Um, but I would say probably your first bet would be to make sure that you are uh, like search and social are probably the two I, I would do. It kind of depends on the store and what, uh, what it is that you're selling um, or what you're, what you're trying to, what you're trying to do. Um, search is key. Make sure that, you know, if somebody's searching for, you know, whatever it is that you sell, that you show up when people search for it. And if you don't do that organically, um, paid search is great. You can kind of set, you know, limited daily budgets for that. Uh, you could do the same thing on, on social for Facebook, um, depending on where your audience comes from. If you have a, you know, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a brick and mortar retail store and you don't have people, uh, you know, if they're not going to come all that far to get to you, you can set some pretty, um, pretty effective campaigns on Facebook to, uh, to track that. And then, you know, the, the offline event piece is a little tricky, but um, yeah, I'd say that, you know, probably I would start with search and social and then sort of like move up the funnel. So try and get the, the best you can from the actual intent that's out there uh, and then then start sort of moving up or into a uh, branding awareness. Thanks, Brian. I have one more question. Is it possible okay. to track how leads from inventory listing sites may also have been influenced by my paid search campaigns? Inventory listing sites. Um, possibly. It's, it's a little tricky because those those platforms typically won't allow any uh, any tracking on uh, any any outside trackers. Um, if somebody clicks from one of those platforms and comes into your website, uh, like on an actual website visit, um, from there it might be possible to track. Um, but otherwise, from tracking paid search specifically, you'd have to probably use Facebook's attribution tool um, to try and get an idea from that. But um, pretty tricky if somebody, you know, makes a call directly off of those sites and maybe they, you know, looked at like a paid search ad or something like that, went to your website and then came in a different way. Um, really kind of hard from an individual user perspective, but it might be something that you could see if you were looking at um, the, the path length tool or um, uh, in, in Google Analytics, you might be able to see if somebody clicked on a paid search ad and then had a referral come in from the inventory listing site. That might be another way you could see that. Great. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar and thank you to Brian and AdTaxi for an awesome presentation today. Look out for an email this afternoon that'll include um, a recording of today's session, which you can also find on digitaldealer.com slash webinars along with all other um, on-demand webinars that we have to offer. So thank you to everyone. Thank you again, Brian. Thank you very much, Megan. Have a great day.